again, Todd, for leading us uh, in these wonderful songs that we've been led in today. It builds us up so very much. Uh, Brenda Edson sent a text uh, to Jennifer asking that I would uh, let everyone know how much she appreciates all of the care, all of the prayers, uh, the flowers that have been sent. Uh, this has definitely been a season, season of, of great sadness for her and for her family. Uh, but she wants you all to know how much she appreciates you. Uh, I think she's pretty overwhelmed right now, so we need to continue to keep her in our prayers. Uh, but uh, she did want you to, to know that uh, appreciation she has. While I was out of town last week, uh, as I mentioned, Taylor had both of the sermons, and he did a two-part lesson on a biblical approach to emotion. And I really appreciated the lesson. I was finally able to have time to listen to it as I was driving home Friday night. Uh, and, and listening to both of them together, uh, really appreciated much of, of what, uh, all of what he was able to present, but uh, definitely presented it in a way that I realized there's so many things about this emotion that uh, I know that I've struggled to understand and, and how to communicate as a Christian uh, where emotion belongs, where it doesn't belong, and e even how to respond to it. Of course, I, I think that because of much of what we would call emotionalism uh, is so prevalent in so many forms of religion that we may try to shy away from emotion, uh, maybe uh, to a detriment uh, within the Lord's church. And I really appreciated the study on that. But one of, the, one of the emotions that he talked about in his lesson had to do with the subject of joy. And, you know, Galatians 5.22, as we notice the fruit of the Spirit, he says that it is love joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I know some of the young people here be ready to sing that song. I can't remember all the words to it. Uh, but, but what I want you to notice is that this aspect of joy, uh, this emotion of joy is a fruit of the Spirit. In other words, it's something that the Holy Spirit will produce in us uh, as we draw near and as we are transformed uh, as the seed of God's Word is planted in us, that's something that ought to be taking place. And in Samaria, in Acts chapter 8, uh, in the city of Samaria, when Philip went and preached the gospel there, it tells us that that gospel brought great joy to that entire city. This is just the outcome, or at least it should be the outcome for people who are impacted by the Word of God as a result of that. The Philippian letter. In chapter 4 and in verse 1 tells us to rejoice. And again, I say rejoice always, Paul tells them. It's just so incredibly important and John speaks about it as well. But unfortunately, I've made this point many times that I think that Christianity sometimes is not seen as a system of joy. It's seen as a system of suffering. It's seen as something that we're going, to, uh, we're going to do in order to be saved, but we're going to go through a lot of hard times. And as a result of that, we're going to be serious and somber and stern. And there is a place for gravity. As a matter of fact, the qualifications of an elder and an elder's wife is that they be grave. And, and that means that we need to be serious about serious things. There are some matters that are serious. And we don't need to be flippant and silly about everything but there is that balance within a Christian's life to understand the joy of the gospel and the joy of salvation, but at the same time, how to act about serious things. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson said, uh, he had an entry in his diary that said, I went to church today and I'm not depressed as if that was something to be amazed by. I think for a lot of people, that, that's what came out of going to church, was, was being depressed. And, and some Christians today uh, would, might act the same. And I don't, I, I've mentioned this many times, I don't know that I have always expressed the joy of salvation as much as I should. Because I feel so, it's so important to be serious about all of these serious things. And there are a lot of serious things. But there are a lot of joyful things in our life. And if we're not counting those blessings, and if we are not uh, highlighting those joys in our life, we, we shouldn't expect our children to want to be a Christian. If we don't seem joyful in marriage, we shouldn't expect them to want to get married. And if we don't seem joyful about being a Christian and walking with Christ, we shouldn't expect them to want to do it as well. I want you to look in the 13th Psalm. I find this interesting. 
In the 13th Psalm, we're going to read in verses 1 through 3. And I want you to notice the text here. The psalmist begins in verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Now, now take in uh, the, the context of this, and I think that we've felt this emotion at some point or another. Why is it taking so long for you to answer my prayers? And, and why, am I, why am I still suffering? I've been praying about this for so long, and, and it just seems like that this won't leave me. So this is what the psalmist is asking in verse 2. How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? This is real, isn't it? I mean, this is something that we have experienced in one level or another. Then verse 3. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. He's saying, give me some insight here. Help, help me to, to be able to understand and to cope with some of this. And verse 4, lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him, lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. This is a, a pretty serious psalm, isn't it? The psalmist is saying, I'm going through some difficult times and I'm wondering, why is this taking so long? Then in verse 5, he says, But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. You know, this is, uh, as as Taylor uh, used the phrase last week, reframing our situation. Because we, sometimes we can take our situation and we can frame it in a very somber, bitter, down situation. But when we step back and we take in the panorama of everything that God has done for us, He says, you know what? I'm going to remember some things. I'm going to, I'm going to tr- I've trusted in your mercy and my heart's going to rejoice in your salvation. I don't understand what's going on right now. I don't know why this evil persists. I don't completely understand why I haven't been rescued yet, but you know what? I've been saved. I have so much to rejoice in here, and God has dealt so bountifully with me, and He reframed completely the whole picture of His day, of His life, even of the present situation that He was in. And I think that that's so wonderful as we see this, and it helps us to understand how important it is that we rejoice in our salvation, that we find that joy in our salvation. Because there are going to be plenty of days that we can find the negative things to look at. And I'm not saying that we need to have this Pollyannish, uh, uh, you know, uh, rose-tinted glasses and never see anything wrong. These things are real. We're going to have sorrows. We're going to have heartaches. We're going to have disappointments, betrayals. and, And sometimes it's going to feel like it lasts a long time. The way that we get through that is to hold fast to the joy of our salvation. That's not the joy of our wealth. That's not the joy of our success. That's not the joy of our health because all of those things can change. All of those things can be taken away from us. Whether it's wealth, whether it's success, whether it's health, all of these things are dynamic and sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not. But you know what can't be taken away from you? is your salvation. You can surrender it, but it cannot be taken away from you. That's something that you can hold on to and the resultant joy that comes out of that. But here's the big picture of this psalm, and this is what we've got to understand. This psalm is showing us that things often don't go our way. And I bet just about everybody here is probably going, (laughs) yeah, that was this week, or that was last week, that's been this month, or that's been this past year. Things don't often go our way, but here's what I think that we need to draw from this. And that is that despair and gloom are not the answer. They never are. The further that we go into despair, the further that we go into gloom and negativity about it, the worse it's going to be. We're just going to make our lot worse and worse as we go. But on the other hand, trusting in the Lord's mercy and rejoicing in His salvation is the single greatest sustaining power in everything that we go through that we'll ever find. Remember in the book of Nehemiah when, when uh, um, 
Ezra read from the book of the law, and the people realized that they hadn't read from it in so long, and they're weeping, they're crying. And so the priests are teaching them the application of the things that are being read, and they're having to tell the people, don't cry. This isn't a day to cry. You need to be joyful. And, and they say there in Nehemiah chapter 8, in verse 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Uh, that can probably be uh, uh, maybe stretched too far, but I think it's very powerful to understand that when we lose our joy, we lose our strength. And we have the ability to, to sustain it. We have the ability to, to have that joy. And I know that I, I probably talk about this a lot now. I come back to it often, and it's probably because I need it. But I think that all of us need to be reminded how important this emotion is in our uh, walk as a Christian. But the question comes up then, from a very practical standpoint, how do we find joy in salvation when everything around us seems to be so disheartening? That's real. Sometimes it just feels like everything is going wrong. Whether we're looking at society, maybe looking at our own family, or looking at, at work, or looking at the economy, or, or, or maybe uh, uh, church problems. I mean, we've been through those times in this congregation where it, it just felt heavy. Some of the things that we had to deal with, we got through those things. And we were able to stay on top of those things. And I think that our prayer services helped us through many of those very difficult times. And it's something that we need to sustain. But how do we find and, and how do we focus on the joy of salvation when everything seems so disheartening? That's what I want you to consider with me this morning by looking at this psalm. And one of the first things I think that we see in the how do we maintain that joy or find that joy is first of all, it's realized that joy is going to be realized in the knowledge of God's resources. Regardless of how difficult things are, how bad things are, we've got to understand the resources that are at God's hand, that we can acquire from Him. God is the source, that is, He's the wellspring, He's the fountain of happiness. You know, in the 144th Psalm, and in verse 15, happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And then just go two more Psalms down, the 146th Psalm. And in verse 5, happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help. Um, that's just a statement of fact. And I think that we can all agree and understand. Yet yeah, that, that's absolutely true. I mean, sometimes we're not happy because of the things that we're going through, but we have plenty to be happy about. Sometimes we're just not finding that happiness, and we've got to realize that that's where it comes from. You know, the 103rd Psalm, we're going to spend some time in the Psalms this morning. The 103rd Psalm is the praise of a happy man. Look in the first and the second verse, 103rd Psalm. He says in verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You're familiar with the song. It probably comes to your mind. The song that we sing, the song that you've heard. And that's, that's what this is all about. He's saying, I need to make a, a resolute commitment and determination to lift up praise to God for all that he has done for me. Always. And this is is where we're going to find that happiness. He goes on down in verse 22, and he, as he closes out this chapter or this psalm and says, Bless the Lord, all His works in all places of His dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. That's where happiness is going to be found. It's going to be found in the Lord in everything that we do. You know, David prayed to God in the 51st Psalm. And in verse 1, he said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Then verse 8, Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. David's saying, I miss that. That's something I had when I was in fellowship with you. When I, had not, when, when I was walking with you and I was living in righteousness, I had a joy and a happiness 
And, and sometimes we take that for granted and we don't appreciate it until it's gone. And David's saying, please restore that to me. Then in verse 12, he says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. There's that sustenance. There's that upholding. And it comes back to this emotion of joy and understanding the importance of that. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and in verse 6, the Bible tells us there that now godliness with contentment is great gain. The happy man is a content man. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And I believe that to a large degree that contentment comes as a result of godliness. And that godliness being right with God is where we're going to find that happiness and therefore that contentment. It's something that people are searching for. We have another song, Happiness is the Lord. It's real. That, that's very true. That doesn't mean that, that there's not going to be times when, as Taylor was talking about last week, that we're not stirred to, to righteous indignation about something going on around us. Or we're not concerned about a brother or a sister's spiritual well-being. Those things are going to happen, but they don't dominate us. Because we are always fully aware of the happiness that we have because of our salvation in Christ. But it's not just happiness. God is the source of wisdom. He's going to give us insight. And that's what the psalmist was asking for there in the text of the 13th Psalm. He's asking that God would enlighten his eyes because that wisdom gives us the, oh, okay, that's what's going on. It helps us to be able to see around the traffic jam and to realize, oh, this isn't going to take long at all. Or the wisdom to understand, oh, this is a terrible accident. Somebody is, is seriously hurt. I can stay here all day. I just want them to be taken care of. Just that knowledge and that wisdom of what's really going on. And God gives us that in His Word. In Proverbs chapter 2 and in verse 6, he says, the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path when wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul. Discretion will preserve you and understanding will keep you. Now this is how we describe uh, the wisdom to be able to see temptation for what it really is. We were talking about uh, the lost son in Luke 15 in our Bible class this morning. And he believed that if he could just get his inheritance right now, take it all with him, he was finally going to be happy. He wouldn't be under his dad's rule. He could go out on his own. He wanted his inheritance now. And he lost his inheritance, he lost the freedom that he thought he was going to have, he lost his happiness, he lost everything. Because he did not have the insight and the wisdom to understand how he was being tempted. We've got to be able to understand that good things come to those who wait. We've got to be able to understand that what the world promises is false. It doesn't deliver, it doesn't gratify, it doesn't bring happiness or contentment. Happiness truly is the Lord. And His wisdom, as we read through His Word, He gives us the wisdom to be able to see that looks really alluring, but behind it is something that's not so good. As, as the proverb writer says, in the end it's bitter as wormwood. It, it seems sweet in the beginning, but in the end it's bitter as wormwood. That's wisdom. And that's what gives us happiness because we dodge the bullet. We might be thinking at the time, ah, man, everybody else is enjoying that and I'm not, but you know, God tells me that I'm doing the right thing here and that this is going to be better in the long run. And then eventually we look back and we go, wow, wow. I'm so thankful for the wisdom that God gave me and that I didn't make those choices. That, that that's not the route that I took and that is the blessing of wisdom. In James chapter 3, James chapter 3, James by inspiration says in verse 17, The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. It's good. Everything about it 
is going to bless our lives when we have that wisdom that comes from God. And that wisdom, God tells us we can ask for wisdom in James chapter 1 in verses 5 through 8, but only those who are fully committed are going to receive that wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, James 1 and 5, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man and stable in all his ways. God's offering us that wisdom. So joy is going to come, even in difficult times. You know, sometimes just having the insight to understand what's going on. The suffering hasn't been taken away, but we, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We see why it's happening, and we understand that in the end it's going to be better. You know, that's what Job was really longing for. And, and his life was even better than at the beginning when it was all over. He just didn't see that at the time. He was struggling with that. God is the source of that kind of wisdom. But all, God is also the source of strength. And that's what we all need in those difficult times. We're, we're looking for something that's going to uphold us. Get me through this day. That's what I need. And many times that's our prayer. Just get me through this day. This has been the hardest day that I can remember. Please help us through this. And God is the source of that strength. That's what He's telling us in Isaiah chapter 40 and in verse 28. In Isaiah 40 and in verse 28, He says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? Well, yeah, I know He's strong. His understanding is unsearchable. Now listen to verse 29. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's a promise. He is the source of strength. He says, wait on me. And I can give this to you. He gives strength to the weak. Remember when Paul was praying about the thorn in his flesh in 2 Corinthians 12? And he said, please remove this. And God says, no. He said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, that's one of those paradoxes that we're like, ah, yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. Strength made perfect in weakness. But Paul said, I'm going to rejoice in my infirmities now because when I am weak, then I am strong. Because I'm relying on God. That's what I was talking about uh, uh, earlier when I was talking about as a father and as a husband feeling like I needed to do all this stuff. No, that's not where strength is at. Strength is not found in figuring out how I can be better and better at this. Strength is found in relying on God. And when we realize that we're not that strong in and of ourselves and we need God, that's when that strength is going to be there. And so here we're finding this, that God is the source of that and he, he, we will mount up with wings like eagles. In the 46th Psalm and in verse 1, you're familiar with this, the 46th Psalm and in verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose stream shall, not, uh, shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. He shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered His voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And he goes on down all the way through verse 11. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear. He burns the chariot. Be still and know that I am God. This is where the strength is going to be found. Even in the midst of trouble. Even in the midst of sorrow, of persecution, of suffering. When things aren't going our way. He can supply that strength that we need. I know I'm going to be okay. Everything's swirling around me. The wind and the waves, everything is, feels like it's going crazy. And, and it is intended to intimidate me. It is intended to discourage me. It's intended to get me to quit. And God's saying, I'll give you strength in the midst 
of the storm. If you'll turn to me. Yes, he gives us that strength. And, and of course, in, in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul puts it this way in verse 14. He said, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. That was Paul's prayer. And it's something that you and I can attain to. His Word is going to strengthen us. The, the, the instrument of the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 2. And, and as we talked about this morning earlier, our high priest strengthens us. In Hebrews 2 and in verse 16, we read this right before we closed the first hour. For indeed, He does not give aid to angels, but He does give aid to the seed of Abraham. In verse 18, For in that He Himself has suffered being tempted, He's able to aid those who are tempted. We find that strength in Him. He is the source of it. But I want you to see secondly, that we're going to realize that joy in salvation through forgiveness. That is, you know, the heaviest burden that man has ever had to bear comes as a result of sin. In Isaiah 59 and verses 1 and 2, it separates us from God. Romans 6 and 23, the wages of that sin is death. That is eternal separation from God. In Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 27, a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. And in verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I'm going to tell you, that is the heaviest burden anyone will ever bear in their life is that burden of sin. And that's the reason that our society is in the situation that it's in. I mean, we're seeing a society of people throughout this world that are absolutely lost and miserable and so depressed there is no hope because of sin. And they're not solving the sin problem. Forgiveness brings the elimination of that burden. It brings freedom from the bondage of sin. God sent His Son to die for our sins while we were yet sinners. Romans 5 in verses 6-8. through 8. In Matthew 11, Jesus said in verse 28, Come to Me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for My yoke is easy, My burden is light. Yes, there's a yoke and there's a burden of Christ, our obedience to Him, but it is light compared to that burden of sin. We can have joy. We can have peace. We can have rest with His yoke. When we're baptized, we're forgiven of our sins. Acts 2.38 They're remitted. They are cast away from us. In Romans 6 and verses 3 through 7, he tells us there that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's the freeing. We need to go back and remember where we came from. We need to never forget what life was like before we obeyed the gospel. And how insecure, how frightened, how, how difficult everything seemed. And how glorious it became when we began to walk in newness of life. That's why in Acts chapter 8 and verse 39, when the Ethiopian was baptized, the Bible tells us that he went on his way rejoicing. His life had been changed in a very real way. So the joy of salvation is found in, in being able to uh, understand the resources that God has. He's the wellspring of, of happiness and of wisdom and of strength, but also is found in forgiveness. I mean, that's the greatest gift that we could ever receive in this life, is to be made pure and to be made clean again. Whenever, when everything is going against us, you know, who can really harm us? I'm forgiven of my sins. They can take my life away, but they cannot kill the inner man. They cannot destroy my spirit. 
I'm going to win. That's what we've got to remind ourselves. Because I've been forgiven, I'm a victor. I'm more than a victor in Jesus Christ. So, come what may, I have a place where I can find joy. That doesn't mean that everything is all great and happy. I see the seriousness of this, of this situation. And, and, and I'm mindful of what is involved. But in the big picture, I'm a conqueror. I'm a victor because of forgiveness. And finally, the joy of salvation is achieved through obedience. That daily obedience and walking with Him. We can know the truth when we obey God. John chapter 8 and verse 31 and verse 32. He says in verse 31, If you abide in My Word, you are My disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Through obedience, through abiding in His Word, we can know truth. We don't have to be lost. We don't have to be filled with questions. We can understand what God's will is for us and not only understand it, but we can know what to do, how to obey it. Ephesians 5 and verse 17, he says, Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And I want you to remember in this context, he's talking about the fact that uh, in, in verse uh, earlier in the chapter, in verse 8, you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now listen to verse 10. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. We can know that. When we obey Him, He's going to guide us in that way. We can know the truth. We can know how to obey the truth. And we can have assurance. In 1 John chapter 5 and in verse 13. In 1 John chapter 5 and in verse 13. He's telling us that we he wrote these things that we may know that we have life. In Romans 8 and verse 16, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit. The Spirit bears witness through the Word of God. Remember Hebrews chapter 10 and about verse 15? The Spirit bears witness through the Word of God. He, he quotes a passage of Scripture as testimony of the Spirit. So when the spirit, spirit bears witness with our spirit, He's talking about the fact that the Spirit through the Word of God is bearing witness to the same thing that we know that we've done. And that is that we are children of God. The Bible tells us how to be children of God. We mentioned that earlier this morning from Galatians 3 in verses 26 and 27. We are children of God through faith because... We were baptized into Christ and have put on Christ. And when my spirit says I've done that, the Holy Spirit says if you've done that, you're a child of God. His witness bears witness with our spirit. And it's all about that confidence and that assurance that we have. And that goes back to verse 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. That confidence that we are His child. We can have that as a result of obedience. Even in the midst of suffering, in, even in the midst of difficult times, knowing that we are right with God. And we can be aware of the fact that we are recipients of His blessings. Ephesians 1 and in verse 3, He says that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. And we can know that rest. Revelation 14 and in verse 3, or verse 13. Revelation 14 and verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. We can know that rest. We can know what is laid up for us. And regardless of what we're going through, we know how the story ends. And it's not going to end in suffering. It's not going to end in misery. Not if we're a child of God. We can rejoice because we know that it ends in glory, in victory, in overcoming. And all those things that hurt us, all those things that tried to bring us down, are going to be cast away, cast into that lake of fire, and we're going to live in glory from then on. The gospel is for our advantage, that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly, but it ought to be a life filled with joy, the joy of our salvation. 
And you can do that as a Christian. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian and you haven't obeyed the gospel, then you can do that before it's too late. If you will come believing in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, confess your faith in Him, repent of your sins, and be baptized in water for the remission of sins, you can have all those sins taken away. That terrible burden can be completely removed from you, washed away this morning. And we can assist you in doing that. Before we leave here, there's no reason to leave here carrying that burden of sin and of guilt. Know the joy of His salvation. Whatever your need is, make yourself right with God and let us know how we can help you with that. Won't you please come while we stand and sing?